kind of feel like once I start wearing a 3-2 again, that's like the official start of the season when I actually enjoy living here. These late spring months are kind of a funny time here. Some days it's like the dead of summer. And some days it might as well be a warmer winter day. Or in this case, the morning and the evening. be one of the times during the year when the water is the clearest, relatively speaking, and also the greenest. If you're like me, the next thing that usually comes out of your mouth is... Uh, yeah. I'm just kidding, it's why. Why? Why is the water so green right now? Because we're at the end of the phytoplankton bloom right now. Can you show me? Yeah. <laughs> Phytoplankton, like plants, use sunlight and CO2 to create oxygen and glucose, and that's photosynthesizing. But using those sunlight and nutrients, they need to get that when they're sun. So in the winter time, there's not a lot of phytoplankton in the water. But come spring, when the sun starts to come out, the nutrients in the water increase, and we get this massive bloom of phytoplankton. Come summertime, most of that phytoplankton gets grazed upon and there's not a lot in the water column and the nutrients also get cycled into that larger food chain of the larger plants and animals but come fall the nutrients get recycled during due to the currents and the, phy the phytoplankton have a chance to bloom again when the sun is still out then come winter again they will die off and there'll be less in the water column Called photosystem one and photosystem two. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. I learned this stuff. Oh, I really wish you hadn't said that. But these cute little critters, they're under threat. Not really. They actually produce more than half of the oxygen that we breathe and are a great carbon sink. But our planet, and therefore our species, is under threat due to man-made climate change. And rather than fix the real issues, like transportation, war, we're turning to more modern solutions. Build the wall! So have a look at this. I have been doing quite a bit of research for this video, and I came across some zones which are otherwise perfect for blooming a ton of phytoplankton and therefore taking a bunch of carbon out of the atmosphere. But these places just don't have quite enough iron in the water for the phytoplankton to survive. So it turns out these zones are pretty much the entire Southern Ocean, which is the ocean that surrounds Antarctica and the Pacific Ocean near the equator. So this actually makes a lot of sense because iron is deposited into the ocean in meaningful amounts from land breezes blowing dust off of the land that contains iron into the ocean. You can actually see this really well offshore of the Sahara Desert, which is constantly blowing off dust all the time and sometimes in really huge amounts that you can see via satellite um, that are going into the ocean offshore there. But the equatorial pacific is pretty much the furthest point 
on the earth that you can find from land and the southern ocean is mostly surrounded by other ocean and a gigantic polar ice cap with not a whole lot of dust on it. So no dust, no iron, no phytoplankton. It turns out we can't just dump a bunch of Dutch ovens in the water here to like give them some iron, but do you see where I'm going here? Photos photosynthesis. So these phytoplankton need a special type of iron, but it turns out it's actually not that hard to get it dissolved into the water in these places. And they've done preliminary tests where they dump a certain amount of, of iron into the water in these sites. And within days, there is a huge noticeable phytoplankton bloom where they dumped the iron. So if we did this at scale, we could be dumping tons of iron in and creating massive phytoplankton blooms that are sucking tons of carbon out of the atmosphere and depositing it into the ocean via the carbon cycle, which is a huge win. thing is, once we start dumping iron, it circulates through the massive conveyor belt of global ocean currents and ultimately ends up right here. And although it might not be really effective right here, we don't really know how it is going to affect global ocean chemistry and biology, food webs, that some of which ultimately end up on our plate. It's the ocean is so connected that it's very likely that dumping a lot of iron is going to have large global effects. Also, if we think of the ocean as like a lung cancer patient, which is an apt analogy, fertilizing the ocean with iron is kind of akin to giving that lung cancer patient like some allergy medications. It's gonna treat some symptoms, very mild ones, maybe, but we're definitely not addressing the root cause. If you dig into the science just a little bit further than what we've covered in this video, you'll quickly find that iron fertilization, even in a perfect scenario, barely even makes a dent in our global carbon budget. And it's definitely a type of mitigation or like a band-aid rather than really addressing the root cause of climate change, which is our global greenhouse gas emissions. So the question becomes, is a huge phytoplankton bloom from iron fertilization really worth it? Especially given the consequences and the weak results. These are kind of like, not exactly new questions, but I feel like they're being neglected. So I kind of feel the need to keep asking them and maybe help you think about asking them too. Feel free to leave me a like or subscribe to the channel. That really helps me get this stuff out there. I'm really privileged to be able to bring like things like nuance and hopefully relatively unbiased, accurate information out to all of you. And um, that really helps me out. Also, I made a video a few weeks ago now about uh, why erosion might not be as bad as you think. So if you're interested in that, I'll leave a link there. In the meantime. I'll see you real soon. Bye. What do you think, Jacob, out of 10?